Getting Ready 18. Uh, this is going to encapsulate most of uh, what you should expect to see on this next assessment. So consider this a review for your, your test. All right, so the first section here, we have three forms of an equation. Um, standard form, factor form, vertex form to represent a golf ball being hit off a cliff and into a lake. All right, and we're going to analyze what are the major um, strengths, the major uses of each kind of uh, quadratic formula, quadratic equation. So number one, which expression is the most useful for finding how many seconds it takes for the ball to hit the water? Well, the key to this is that we're looking for the ball to hit the water. So what that means is we're looking for the height to be zero. That would be water level, height zero. Well, when we were asking then, that's like saying we want the y value to equal zero. How, what, which one of these three forms make it easiest for us to find x-intercepts? Okay, so to find x-intercepts, we would want factored form. Factored form. And the reason for that, justifying that, we're looking for x-intercepts. And the reason we want x-intercepts is because we're looking for the height to equal zero. Okay. Now, it didn't tell us to find them, but just out of curiosity, uh, when we look at the factored form above, the expression at, at letter B, our two x-intercepts would be 6 and negative 2. Well, of course, time can't be negative 2, um, so we would want the one that was the positive value, the 6. So that means it takes 6 seconds for the ball to hit the water. All right, number 2. Which one of those expressions is the most useful for finding the maximum height of the ball? Our key in that question is that it's asking us for maximum height. That means we're looking for the vertex. So that almost answers itself. That means the simplest way, not the only way, the simplest way, the quickest way to find that would be vertex form. All right, so the justification for why we want vertex form is because the vertex is always gonna represent the maximum or minimum. And in this case, the maximum occurs at the vertex. Number three, if you wanted to know the height of the ball at exactly three and a half seconds, which expression would you use to find your answer? Explain why. Well, this one, you could choose any of those three. I don't think it's any, it's not a lot easier in any of those three. The idea, if you want to um, know a certain time, for example, three and a half seconds, that means you want to substitute 3.5 for t. Well, none of those three make that exactly easy. So choose any of the three and substitute three and a half for t. All right. The reason you could use any is you substitute 3.5 for t. Now, if I had to choose, I guess I would probably choose uh, vertex form just because there's only one place to substitute the three and a half. Each of the other ones have t occurring twice, so you have to substitute it in twice. That's not much of a reason, uh, and that's why I say any of the three could, could work, whatever you're more comfortable with. If you wanted to know the height of the cliff above the lake, which expression would you use? Now, remember, we're hitting the golf ball from a cliff. So when they say the height of the cliff above the lake, what we're looking for there is the y-intercept. That's where the golf ball starts. So which one of these three make it easier to find the y-intercept? And that would be standard form. All right. And because we're looking for y-intercept. The y-intercept is the constant, the c value in uh, standard form. So the height of the, that cliff is 58.8, what are we in, meters? Meters.
in this next set of problems, um, we're going to be looking at five representations of quadratic functions, right? The three equation forms, standard, vertex, and factored, a table, and a graph. Uh, you're going to be given one of those, and then you fill in the other four. All right, now, each time that we have to do a graph, I've already located the axes where I thought it worked best for me. Uh, you will have to make that decision yourself based on the points you put in your table. So in this first one, we're starting out with factored form. So what should I do next? Standard form, vertex form, and I, I do like to make all the equations before I go mess with the table and the graph. Um, from factored form, your next logical step would be standard form, because all you have to do is FOIL. Okay. So I will first times first, x squared, outers, negative 3x, inners, positive 5x, and last, negative 15. So my factored form is, or I'm sorry, my standard form is y equals x squared. Now I'm combining those two middle terms, negative 3x plus 5x is positive 2x minus 15. Now, vertex form, I'm going to use that answer I just came up with for standard form. Okay, so vertex, the way we get that is we complete the square. Right, because we want that vertex form is y equals a times x minus h squared plus k. So we're going to take this standard form, and if you've forgotten the process, we're going to leave the x squared plus 2x as is and move our negative 15 over here. We're going to come back. We're not throwing it away. We're not going to forget about it, but we'll use it later. Because what we need in order to get this x minus h squared is we need this to be a perfect square trinomial. Well, with a minus 15, it's not. How did I know that? Well, that's the same test here that's going to also tell us what we do want to have. And that test was we take the b term, the 2, chop it in half, so 2 divided by 2 would be 1, and then square that. Okay, so it's the b term over 2 and squared. 1 squared is 1. That means we want to have 1 as the c, as the constant. Well, we didn't. We had negative 15. So I'm going to... That's why I moved the negative 15 away. I'm going to put a plus 1 there because that'll work. That'll do what I want it to do. That'll make this a perfect square trinomial. But I'm not allowed to just add a 1 into the right-hand side of this equation just any time I feel like it unless I balance that out by later subtracting it. So what I wrote here in black, a plus 1 and a minus 1, I really did nothing. I added it, but then I subtracted it, which means it's not really there. Um, so now, I get to mentally, you don't have to physically write in these parentheses, but mentally I'm saying, okay, this first three terms here, this is a perfect square trinomial, so I can write that as my binomial squared, x plus 1 squared. Now, out here, I haven't forgotten about these, but now I'll put them together, negative 1 and minus 15 is negative 16. So there's my vertex form. y equals quantity x plus 1 squared minus 16. All right. So it makes sense, I think, to fill out the table before we do the graph, because the table will lead me to uh, just where I should locate those uh, axes and what kind of scale I need. So it says we do need the vertex and at least two on each side. So they do give us exactly five rows in that table. Um, so I'm going to locate the vertex here in the middle, so then I'll know I have two on each side. I do want to, normally this wouldn't matter, but I'm going to need to um, count by ones in the X column. And I need these to be in order because down here it says we need to show the first differences and second differences. All right. So normally I wouldn't, if, if that last uh, sentence direction down there wasn't there, I wouldn't worry about how I wrote those points or which points I selected. But because of ask, being asked for the first and second differences, I do want these points to go in order. Okay, So the vertex 
of course, will come from vertex form, and that's the point negative 1, negative 16. Right? It's opposite of the sign we see in this parentheses, and then the k. Well, the two points before negative 1 would be negative 2 and negative 3, and after negative 1 would be 0 and 1. Now, hopefully, you would just put one of these equations, doesn't matter which one, um, put one of them into your calculator and y equals, go to the table, you know where the vertex is, so just look at the two points before it and after it. And we should see symmetry around there anyway. Okay. Now, I don't have a calculator in my hand here, so how else can we come up with these? Well, I know that when I look at the standard form, this C term right here is the y-intercept. So if x is 0, y is negative 15. And that means, again, because of symmetry, that negative 2, the y-value, is also negative 15. That's about all I can get for these points in my table without a little bit of work. But if I get just one of these two, if I substitute either the negative 3 or the 1 and get that value, it's going, the other one's going to be the same, again, because of symmetry. So I'm going to substitute 1 into, just because I have the room right here, into this vertex form. So f of 1 is 1 plus 1 squared minus 16. 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 squared is 4. Minus 16 is negative 12. Now, it did say at least two points on each side of the vertex. I also know about uh, the two x-intercepts from my factored form. So I'm going to also make sure, just for a more accurate graph, that I also know where those x-intercepts go. So one of them is negative 5, and another one is 3. So when I go to my graph here, 2, negative 5, and positive 3. If I have all of my points down here around the vertex, I kind of lose sight of the uh, shape, the, the, how wide open the parabola should be. And there's your parabola. Now, the one more part of the directions here said we are to indicate first and second differences. So first differences from negative 12 to negative 15 is down 3. Then it goes down 1 then up 1, then up 3. So those first differences establish a linear pattern. And I know they're linear because the second differences from negative 3 to negative 1 is positive 2, positive 2. These second differences are constant. All right, so number 6 now, we are starting out with vertex form. Uh, when we're... Beginning with vertex form, the logical order to go through these is we start here, we will multiply that out, combine till we get standard form, and then once in standard form, we'll try to factor. Okay. So from vertex form, remember this binomial squared here actually means we should write it twice and FOIL it. Now. Before we go any further, if we look at this and you might say, hey, well, there's factored form. Don't I already have that? It's not factored form because of this plus 4. In factored form, it has to be just a series of factors, of quantities, uh, whether it be monomials or binomials, that are multiplied together. With this plus 4 in here, it cannot be considered factored form. Okay. Now, remember, we're heading towards standard. So we want to FOIL here. We have negative 3, and then we're multiplying by x squared minus 1x minus another 1x plus 1. And we still have plus 4 outside. I'll combine my like terms inside the parentheses, so negative 3 times x squared minus 2x plus 1, and then keep your plus 4. Distribute negative 3 only into the parentheses, so negative 3x squared plus 6x minus 3, and then don't forget about your plus 4. 
When I combine those two like terms at the end, I have negative 3x squared plus 6x plus 1. So standard form y equals negative 3x squared plus 6x plus 1. Now, factored form, remember the first thing we checked for is a GCF. I do not have one. Then I try the magic x. I'm multiplying a times c for a desired product of negative 3. I take my b term, which is 6, and that's the desired sum. So to get a negative product, I need one positive and one negative. Now, the only factors of 3 are 1 and 3. There's no combination of a positive and a negative with 1 and 3 that would give us a sum of 6. So that means it cannot be factored. This one is prime. Right? There is no factored form. So we only have the two forms of equations. Again, since I have to do the vertex and two points on either side, I'm going to locate my vertex in the center of this table and get that from my vertex form. So it comes from the h and the k. h is opposite of the sign, you see, so it's positive 1 and 4. So two points on either side, I'm going to go with 0 and negative 1, and then 2 and 3. For the y-intercept, I know I can pick that out from the standard form. It's the c term, so the y-intercept is 1, meaning I can also assume this is 1 when I substitute 2 for x. Now again, if you have a calculator, you're getting these straight from the table, but without using a calculator, I need to substitute either negative 1 or 3 into one of these formulas. It doesn't matter which one. So if I decide I'm going to do f of 3 in standard form this time, just to change it up, that means I substitute a 3 everywhere there's an x. So 3 squared is 9 times negative 3 is negative 27 plus 18 plus 1. Well, negative 27 plus 18 is negative 9 plus 1 is negative 8. So if this is negative 8, then so is that. Showing my first and second differences, this goes up 9, up 3, down 3, up 9. Those are the first differences, and that is a linear pattern, which I am certain of because the second differences are constant. Whoops, I'm sorry that I wrote that last that last first difference was negative 9. And this last second difference here is negative 6. So those second differences are constant. All right, again, I've located my axes where I thought were appropriate for my points. Um, you, you don't have to match mine as so. That one is open down because of this negative A value. All right, number seven, we are starting out with standard form this time. Um, you can do either one of the vertex or factored next. It doesn't matter because you're going to, for each one of those, you're going to come back to standard form to solve for it. Okay. So I am going to start here at standard. I'll do vertex next and factored last. So for finding vertex form, I need to complete the square on this. Now that negative in front of the x squared sign, I need to get that out. So my first step is to undistribute a negative from all of that trinomial. So negative 1 times what is negative x squared? Well, negative 1 times x squared. Negative 1 times negative 10x makes 10x. And negative 1 times positive 25. Now. Again, to check to see if this is a perfect square, I would chop the middle term in half, so negative 10 over 2, and then square it. 
and it should match this if it is a perfect square. Well, negative 10 over 2 is negative 5, and when I square that, it's 25. So that tells me this is already a perfect square trinomial. I don't have to do completing the square. The trick here was getting out that negative 1. Once you do that, um, it's not bad. We can jump to our vertex form of y equals negative 1 times. Now, what is the binomial we've squared? It's x minus, to match the negative 10, x minus 5 quantity squared. So the k value is 0. Right? There's nothing out there. Now to find my factored form, again, I'm going back to the standard form, right? I look for a GCF, and again, with that negative A value, I like to take that out first. So negative 1 times, we can just recopy what we have to the left here in red. And then to factor this trinomial, that also, that also we have from what we worked out looking for vertex form. We know that x squared minus 10x plus 25 is a perfect square trinomial. We just got through saying that. So I can write this in factored form as negative 1 times x minus 5 times x minus 5, or I can copy exactly what I wrote for vertex form. Okay, either one. You can repeat what you wrote for vertex form, oops, or if you feel like writing it out, if this is clearer to you, if it looks more like factored form, that's fine too. For my vertex, it comes from h, k, so my vertex is 5, 0. To get two points on either side, that means I'm going to be looking at 4 and 3, and after the, the vertex, 6 and 7. Okay. Now, I know that my y-intercept is negative 25. I'm not going to be fitting that on my graph. Um, it doesn't belong in my table anyway. So that means I've got to substitute in a couple of values here. Or, again, use your, the, the y equals feature on your graphing calculator. So I feel like the simplest place to plug this in would be into vertex form. So I could say f of 4 equals negative 1 times 4 minus 5 squared. That's negative 1 times negative 1 squared. Negative 1 squared is 1 times negative 1 is negative 1, which means f of 6 is also negative 1. All right, then I can do either f of 3 or f of 7, up to me. I'll do f of 3 just because it's a smaller number. Again, I'm plugging it into vertex form. f of 3 is 3 minus 5 squared, okay? So negative 1 times, this is negative 2 squared. Negative 2 squared is 4, so negative 1 times 4 is negative 4 which means f of 7 is also negative 4. To look at my first and second differences, first differences, this goes up 3, then up 1, then down 1, then down 3. Second differences are negative 2. All right, now number eight, a little trickier. We have the graph given to us, no equations. So let's identify what we can from the graph. We know from looking at this graph that the x-intercepts are negative 3 and negative 2. We know that the y-intercept is 3. And we know that the vertex has to happen at negative 2.5. Now, we don't know the y value. We could estimate and say, well, we know it's, it's some small decimal or fraction, and it's negative. But we don't know that yet. Okay, there's, the only reason we know it's at negative 2.5 is because it's always located exactly 
between, halfway between the two x-intercepts. So the average of negative three and negative two is negative two and a half. So how can we make this work for us? Well, I know a few things, and I'm, I, I can kind of already fill in um, some pieces of each equation, but I don't have all of any of these yet. So the y-intercept being three means when I write standard form, it's going to end with plus three. The vertex, I know it starts with x plus 2.5 squared. I don't know the a or the k. And in factored form, I know that the two binomial factors are x plus 3 and x plus 2. But I don't know the a value. There is an a value. I know that because this has very obviously been dilated since the vertex is not um, one below those, those intercepts there. So how do I find the a value? Well, I'm going to take the only equation that I have out of the three where a is the only thing missing. Okay? A is the only thing missing in factored form. So I got to find this one first. In vertex, I was missing a and k. In standard, I'm missing a and b. So in factored form, the only thing I'm missing is the a value. All right? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to choose one point on this graph that we know the x and y values. I could use either of the x-intercepts. I could use the y-intercept. I could use this point over here, negative 5, 3. I can use any of those points where I know both x and y for sure. I could use negative 1, 1. I could use negative 4, 1. So I'm going to substitute. OK, my choice will be 0, 3. I'm going to use 0, 3 as my point and say, OK, at that point, I know the y value is 3. I don't know the a. I know the x value is 0. I know this x has to be substituting a 0. And now, since only one value is missing, I can solve for a. So 3 is equal to a times 3 times 2. Well, 3 times 2 is 6. So a equals 6. Or, I'm sorry, a times 6. So to solve for a, I divide both sides by 6. A is exactly 1 half. Okay. So once I have the A, I have the A in all forms. It's in the factored form. That's the A in vertex form. That's also going to be the A in standard form. Now, how do I find the other ones now? Well, I have a choice. Since each of these other two equations is only missing one value now, missing either the B for standard or the K for vertex, I could do something similar to what I just did over here in blue. I could substitute a point in there and solve for the missing uh, B or the missing K. Or I could go back to, uh, like I did the last couple problems, where I take the factored form and I change that into, say, standard form. And that's what I'll do. So for the second thing here, I am going to start with my factored form and turn it in to standard. So I will need to FOIL like terms there. And we know we have a 1 half outside. When I distribute the 1 half, I get 1 half x squared plus either 5 halves or 2.5x plus 3. So 1 half x squared I already had. I now found my b to be 5 halves or 2.5 and the 3 I already knew about. Now, in order to come up with uh, the vertex form, I would have to either complete the square with this standard form, or I could 
again, set up something using the vertex form, the amount of it that I have, and solve for k. And in this case, I kind of feel like that's the easier method. So to find vertex form, if I use that point 0, 3 again, I would say the y value is 3. Um, x value is 0. And I don't know k. So 3 is equal to 1 half of 2.5 squared plus k. 2.5 squared is 6.25. So 1 half of 6.25. And 1 half of 6.25 is 3.125 or 3 and 1 eighth. So subtract the 3 and 1 eighth. K is negative 0 0.125, negative 0 0.125, which is also, like I said, negative 1 eighth. Okay. So I now know the vertex. And it looks like, yes, that does definitely look like it could be down 1 eighth. I know the vertex is negative 2.5 and negative 0 0.125, or negative 1 eighth. Um, to come up with first and second differences now, the, the most straightforward way would be to now count by ones in the x's, meaning I would show negative 3.5 and negative 4.5, but I don't have any of those values. If you have a graphing calculator, you can set your table up to show you those pretty simply, but I don't want to do that. So what I will do is find the first and second differences just ignoring, skipping that vertex altogether. So what I mean is I'll still use negative 3 and negative 4, and then I'll use negative 2 and negative 1, but when I count first and second differences, I will breeze right past this purple point and not use it at all. So negative 3, I already know, is 0, and negative 2 is 0. Now I need to find a value. Oops, I can tell on the table. Negative 4 is, sorry, 1, and negative 1 is 1. So here's what I meant by my differences. My first difference is I will just go from 1 to 0 is down 1. From 0 to 0 changes not at all. From 0 to 1 goes up 1. And then my second differences go up one and up one. So I still see a linear pattern in the first differences and a constant in the second differences. I just didn't use that middle point. All right. And finally, the last, um, the last kind we haven't done was to start with a table and come up with three equations and a graph. So. In this one, since the table's already filled out and the x's are uh, in order and counting by ones, so let's go ahead and do our first and second differences and have that out of the way. So my first difference is this goes down 10, this goes down 6, down 2, up 2, up 6, and up 10. The second differences are up 4, up four, and just what we expected, this is a constant second difference. Second difference, first difference. Okay, now we can come up with, um, due to the symmetry that we can see in the table, we can see the pattern going down, 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 till we reach a minimum of negative six, and that's a single point with symmetry around it. And after negative six, we start increasing at exactly the rate we were decreasing. So that indicates to us that our vertex happens right here at three negative six. So in vertex form, y is equal to x minus three squared and then minus six. But I still need to know, is there an a value or is the a value one or something else? Well, the a value if you can see one point each direction from the vertex, so meaning 
Maybe this would be easier to illustrate if I graph these first. Um, to get 12 on there, I would have to count by two. I better not do that. Um, I can graph just these five points. What I was trying to explain about the A is, remember, in a, our normal parent graph for a parabola, if we go to the side one space in each direction, one space here and one space here, it would only go up one spot. But there aren't points there. The points are actually up two spots. Because of that, that's what tells us that the A is 2. Right? So our A value is 2. It's going to stay 2. It's 2 uh, in standard form also. And that's what I will find next. If I, so I found this first. For standard form, I will write this out as 2 times x minus 3 times another x minus 3 minus 6. I'll FOIL, distribute, and combine. So FOIL. Combine. Distribute. And combine once again. So 2x squared minus 12x plus 12. So standard form, y is equal to 2x squared minus 12x plus 12. And the last thing I have left to do, my factored form, I will first look for a GCF, and I have that. 2 can be taken out of all three of those terms. So undistributed 2, I'm left with x squared minus 6x plus 6. And that's all I can factor. Um, when I look in here, there, I didn't miss any GCF. If I try to set up the magic x, my desired product is positive 6, but my sum is negative 6. Okay, so I would have to have both negatives. There are no factors of 6 that add up to negative 6. Not negative 1 and negative 6, not negative 2 and negative 3. So it turns out that this part is prime. Now, that does not mean that the whole trinomial was prime. We did factor it. We took out a GCF. So factored form is 2 times the quantity x squared minus 6x plus 6. It's not, like we, it's not what we expected. It's certainly not very useful. Um, and here's what that really means to us. Normally, in factored form, we can pick out our x-intercepts from each of those binomials. Since we weren't able to factor it that way, what that means is, see these x-intercepts on my graph, they're not rational numbers. Had they been rational numbers, even a nice terminating decimal or a fraction, um, then we would have been able to factor it. All right. So these should seem simple compared to those last few. Verify each factorization by multiplying. That means verify is just show me that it is correct. Right? So that means we're going to multiply this right-hand side. We're going to FOIL it so we can show that, yes, it does match the left-hand side. So first is x squared. Outers, negative 4x. Inners, positive 16x. Last, negative 64. Combining like terms, x squared plus 12x minus 64. So yes, it matches. Number 11, FOIL this first, outers, inners, and last. x squared, these cancel, minus 64. It matches. That's a difference of two squares. Number 12, first, outers, inners, and last. And yes, number 12 does look a lot like number 10. Uh, they're just illustrating what changing one sign does. There are, it doesn't change everything about the problem, but it's certainly not the same. Same 13 looks a lot like number 11. 
except instead of one plus and one minus, they're both negatives. So that makes this become x squared minus 8x, another minus 8x, and plus 64. So rather than canceling the middle terms, as in number 11, we combine negative 8 and negative 8 to negative 16x, and then plus 64. All right, now we are factoring for ourselves. Not verifying, but actually doing it start to finish. Two of them will not factor. So please don't bring in your homework where you have prime written five times. Okay, only two of these will not factor. So 14, we look for a GCF, we don't have one. There's no A value or A is one, so desired product is six, sum is negative five. The product is positive, so I need two of the same sign. Since this is negative, they both have to be negatives. So they add to five and multiply to six, that's two and three. So my factors here, x minus two, x minus three. Number 15, no GCF. So I set up my magic X, look at the product to be negative six and the sum negative seven. Now that one feels like it's gonna work, but this negative six for a product means I need one of each sign, one positive, one negative. Factors of six, two and three, that doesn't make seven. One and six feels like it should, but not with different signs. So this is one of the two that are prime. Number 16, no GCF, desired product negative six, sum of negative one. To get a negative product, we need one of each sign. Be different by one, means we want positive two and negative three. So x plus two and x minus three. Number 17, there is no GCF. My product needs to be 63 positive and my sum positive 16. So these both need to be positive factors. Probably the only factors you have in your head for 63, you learned in seventh grade, seven times nine, and that's it. Those are the ones that work. They add to 16. So M plus seven, M plus nine. Number 18, no GCF. So we have a desired product of negative one, meaning different signs, and a sum of negative three. Well, your only factors for one are one and one. So that certainly, a positive one and a negative one, does not equal negative three. So this is the other one that is prime. All right, now number 19. Now we have an A show up here, which means look even more carefully for your GCF, and it means that longer key number method uh, to try to factor it. So there is no GCF, three can't go into seven. So I multiply, my desired product has to come from A times C, so three times two is six. My sum still comes from B, it's seven. Uh, since the six is positive, I want two of the same sign. Since the seven is positive, these are both pluses. And the factors of six that add up to seven are one and six. So what? Remember, for the key number method, what we use those two numbers for is to break apart the 7x, right? So I'm going to make it 1x and 6x in any order I feel like. So 3x squared plus 1x plus 6x plus 2. Looking at the first two terms, I can remove an x. They have a GCF of x. x times 3x is 3x squared. x times 1 is 1x. Out of the next two, 6x plus 2, I can remove a 2. So 2 times 3x is 6x, and 2 times positive 1 is 2. As is necessary, the binomial in the parentheses matches, so that's one of your factors, 3x plus 1. The other one you make out of your GCFs, x plus 2. All 
Number 20, there is no GCF. I want a product of one. It's positive, so these signs will be the same. They will both be negative because my sum is negative two. Uh, negative and negative. So the factors of one can only be one times one. Negative one and negative one does add to negative two, so this can be factored as n minus one times n minus one, or another way to write it, quantity a minus one squared. Number 21, we have that a value again. So definitely look slowly for your GCF, but you don't have one. For my desired product, I multiply 3 times 10 to make a positive 30. My sum needs to be 11. Since both of these numbers are positive, both factors will be positive. So factors of 30 that add to 11, 6 and 5. Use your 6 and 5 to break up 11x, so we see 3x squared plus 6x plus 5x plus 10. So these first two, I can remove a 3x. So 3x times x is 3x squared. 3x times 2 is 6x. For the next two, I can remove a 5. 5 times x is 5x. 5 times 2 is 10. We match in here. So factors are x plus 2 times 3x plus 5. And lastly, on this screen here, number 22, we don't have a GCF, so we multiply 8 times 3 and say we're looking for a product of 24. Since the middle term is negative 11, I need both negative signs, so I need factors of 24 that add to 11, 3 and 8. So 8c squared minus 8c minus 3c plus 3. Out of the first two terms, I can undistribute an 8c. That would be times c minus 1. Out of these two, the GCF that my eyeballs tell me I have is a 3. But remember, when this third term is negative, you always need to undistribute a negative. So minus 3 times c, and negative 3 times what is 3? It's negative, c, negative 3 times negative 1. So we match here. So we have c minus 1 times 8c minus 3. Okay, number 23, a binomial. A binomial is either GCF or difference of two squares, or, or possibly both. There is no GCF. So as a difference of two squares, I just sort of go through that name as a checklist. It is difference of two terms, both perfect squares. The square root of 64x squared is 8x, and the square root of 9 is 3. Since I was able to answer all of those questions in the affirmative, I know this factors as simply 8x plus 3 and 8x minus 3. Now, if you didn't recognize it, again, you could think of it or even write it like this. You have no x's in the middle, or your b is 0. So when you went to try to factor it, you would have to multiply 64 times negative 9, which is, geez, negative 576. The sum would need to be 0. Since this number is negative, one positive and one negative. And um, being that the sum has to be 0, these two numbers have to actually be the same thing. So the square root of 576 is 24. So then you would factor this like, or rewrite this as 64x squared minus 24x plus 24x minus 9 from these first two terms, I can factor out an 8x. And from the last two, I can factor out a 3. So I will eventually get to 8x plus 3 and 8x minus 3. But if you can recognize it as difference of two squares, you can save yourself a lot of headache. All right, so which of those quadratic expressions that we just made above, so the factored expressions, could represent the area of a square. 
So if we go back through these, nope, couldn't be a square. The only one that could be a square is this one. And the reason is it's two binomial factors are the same, or it's a, a perfect square trinomial. So number 20, because it was a perfect square trinomial, OK? Because the factors were n minus 1 times n minus 1, and these two factors were the same. That's, that's how we know that it could be a square. The sides have to be equal. So were any of those up there in factored form? So that means ignore the two primes. Were the other eight, was there anything that could not be side lengths for a rectangle? And the answer to that's no. That's why we showed you that um, whole method with drawing the area, the, the algebra tiles. Um, the sides of the rectangle can be any two binomials. It doesn't matter if they look like n minus 1 times n minus 1 or 8x plus 3 and 8x minus 3. All of the ones that could factor could be side lengths of rectangles.